link at the end of the session in the chat. So with that, I will give it over to our uh, presenters. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Lindsay. And I don't know if y'all can see me. I'm waving here sort of from the, uh, the side of the camera view. Um, my name is Martin Oliver. I'm the faculty chair of the AU core. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of uh, kick us off and, and get, a, get us introduced here. Um, it, so uh, the role of the faculty chair of the, of the core is to uh, help uh, coordinate and work with and oversee all of the different subcommittees that make up the whole of the core. And I'm really glad to be joined today um, by Aaron Gorkowski and Rebecca Hazen uh, from physics and biology, respectively, who are uh, both on the National Scientific Inquiry Subcommittee, uh, as well as Diamond Brown, who's the CORE's assessment analyst. Um, we also have in the room a couple of other of our subcommittee members, uh, Marjan and Clarissa. Um, and uh, what's, what's going on here, and uh, then we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, we're in the process of assessment for the core, right? Like we built this big thing and then the question is, well, does it work and how would we know? Um, so the, our approach to assessment for the core has been, uh, um, uh, I think unique in that we recognize that the core is this diverse and dynamic program uh, for which no singular rubric or approach was gonna work, right? Um, the way that we think about trying to ascertain whether or not the learning outcomes uh, are, are effective for natural scientific is not the same for creative aesthetic or for complex problems or for the sort of the Q2, the quantitative reasoning uh, courses. So in each of our subcommittees, we allowed all of them to develop and really sort of think about um, assessment as a research question or a research project. Like, uh, are the learning outcomes being implemented in the course? Uh, how would we know that? Are they being uh, used for assignments? And are then uh, the students given an opportunity to express or practice or show their facility with all those learning outcomes? Um, so each of our committees have developed their own approaches to it, which means we've got this really uh, wide ranging uh, approach to assessment. It also means that we've got a lot of kind of fun chance to experiment with how we do assessment. Everybody's got, each of the subcommittees is given sort of free reign to be like, hey, how are we gonna make this work? What are the questions that we wanna ask? What do we think is the most effective method for our particular area to explore the question of, of whether or not uh, core works? One of the cool things that uh, has come about as a, a part of this, and uh, one of the other sort of tasks of the subcommittees is to also review courses from study abroad. So students who are studying abroad will uh, find a class and say, hey, we think that this might work for, say, natural scientific inquiry. And in order to get credit for that, uh, for that course, what we've asked in this sort of early stage is for students to send us a whole lot of material. They got to send us the syllabus and slides and the assignments and the, the work that they did. And then also do a little write-up where they say, hey, this is, these are the ways in which I think this course did or did not meet the learning outcomes of AU's natural scientific in inquiry uh, have the mind. Um, and we were really struck by the student voice uh, in doing some of this abroad assessment and recognized that um, it was, the students had really a lot to say about those learning outcomes and how they worked and where they saw them happening in the classroom. So part of natural scientific inquiry's uh, approach was to try to capture that student voice um, in a variety of ways. So we'll talk about some of that uh, as we go on today. The, the second part of that is that all good assessment needs to be iterative, right? It needs to like feedback in on itself, right? It's no value of anybody if we like get a rubric, fill out the rubric sheet, submit that into a, a bunch of slides somewhere and then file it away. It's like, who cares? That doesn't do us any good, right? The question really needs to be, um, assessment ought to like change what happens in the classroom. It ought to affect our teaching, our pedagogy. It ought to change our assignments. It ought to change the way that we run a classroom itself. Otherwise, we're just counting beats, and that's that's not useful for us. So this interest in capturing the student voice, and then also asking questions about how then do we feed that back into our classroom, right? How does it change what what goes on in the classroom? Has been an area of uh, particular interest for National Scientific Inquiry. What we're gonna talk about today is the way in which the subcommittee has um, pursued both capturing that student voice and then the ways in which it has uh, changed 
uh, their courses and the classroom and, and the materials. So I'm gonna happily turn it over to uh, Aaron and Rebecca and Diamond um, to take us through that process. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to start it off by just asking you all to complete this like really quick poll, uh, thinking about how can you or how do you um, incorporate student feedback into the classroom. And so we're going to use Menti, uh, Mentimeter. Um, you're just going to go to menti.com and you can enter that code 91969965. Sarah, you can click on the thing and it'll take you to the, like the results. Uh, oh yeah, just click the, like the word that says click poll. All of that's a hyperlink, yeah. Actually, Sarah, that's my bad. The, the link that I sent you is the one that you're supposed to be on. The other one is where everybody else is supposed to be. There we go. Apologize. All right, so we're seeing some of the first things that are coming up. It's semester and weekly feedback, as well as SET guidance for future courses. Put another like thirty seconds or so just to see if anyone else wants to add anything here. So we've got one one big response in the sense of how a lot of people use uh, feedback. I think this is one of the biggest ways that people use feedback from students in their course, those mid-semester evaluations, weekly feedbacks, and then that SET at the end of the session. Uh, Sarah, if you wanna go back to the slides, thank you. Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, and so Martin introduced us a little bit and we'll go a little bit over the goals as well. Um, so what we're doing today is we're gonna interpret and reflect upon some of the student surveys that we used, uh, as well as strategizing effective methods for implementing the and course adjustments, and then also contextualizing those individual findings uh, within the larger scope of how we see natural scientific inquiry learning outcomes and then other habits of mind as well. All right. Um... So like Martin was talking about, one of the things we were, you know, this kind of came from various sorts of assessment and in getting the pretty good feedback from students with their, uh, their study abroad courses, uh, we sort of wanted to 
to come up with a survey that basically looked at what students were taking away from it. So not just you know, were they learning material, but did they sort of understand or see where the learning was supposed to happen or where you know, compared what students thought with what faculty faculty thought in terms of like where they were learning different skill sets um, in, in the class. And so I'll leave the, I'm not going to talk too much right now about the teaching portfolios because I know Rebecca is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I've got some information, I think my next slide about implementation. So we can go on to the, the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a couple slides from now that we have implementation. But yeah, so we, so basically the questions that we asked students were based on the learning outcomes for the course, but sort of rewritten a little bit to not just say, did your course achieve learning outcome one? Like, like I mentioned, we're trying to see where the students felt like they were achieving the different learning outcomes. And so that's where the, these questions ultimately come from. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, Diamond, do you wanna talk briefly about this? Yeah, yeah. So um, we did the survey, we asked the students those five questions. Uh, we initially started with uh, Aaron asking uh, this at the end of his class back in spring 2023. And then it was repeated again with uh, Rebecca and Aaron's class last fall. Uh, and so you'll see uh, in those responses, they were very much open-ended questions that the students were being asked. So they respond to them with like short uh, response sort of questions, maybe two or three sentences most of the time. And so in that, uh, analyzing what we did was we would take sort of the essence of what the students were saying and then we would code it uh, looking at all of the responses together to try to see what sort of trends or what sort of patterns were arising and then um, using that to code them and group them into sort certain groups uh, and so what we'll do is we're going to actually give you a chance to sort of see our raw data uh, code it yourselves and then we'll be able to sort of come back, discuss it, and then we'll actually get into what those results look like for us. And so what we're gonna do is, um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat, uh, since most of us uh, seem to be here in that way. Uh, I'm gonna drop a link into the chat for you all to be able to access this um, uh, spreadsheet that we have. You're gonna take the one question, uh, each one should be assigned. I tried to look at all the attendees that we already have. Um, you're going to code one question, and there are 13 students. So basically, just try to look at all of the responses and begin to sort of group them together so that we can try to see what patterns or what trends may be emerging amongst the students and how they're uh, connecting to those learning outcomes. And of course, I put the wrong link in the chat just now. All right, this link should take you to a SharePoint site with the Excel file. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind clicking on that link as well, just so that it can be up on the screen. Thank you. Yeah, so you'll see that there are like two columns there, E and F, uh, G and H, et cetera, that have, there's a name at the top or two names at the top. And then what you're just gonna do is you're gonna go down uh, each row and sort of code this, the group of students to see what sort of um, patterns or trends that you're seeing. You will note that none of these student names are actual student names. We just got like random celebrities, give you a little bit of fun, but also to keep the students that actually did this anonymous um, these are actual student responses, so these are not generated in any way, shape, or form. This is uh, 13 students from a specific session of, of one of Aaron's classes. We'll give you like 10 or so minutes to do this, and then we'll come back, check in, see how you're doing, and then go from there.
Um, I think we can go ahead and keep going. Does anybody need more time? I guess we could just go ahead and do a little bit of a discussion. Um, it looks like um, Catherine got through that um, that first column there with the question of briefly describe an assignment or activity where you had to evaluate experiments like a scientist. Um, Catherine, if you feel comfortable coming off, would you mind uh, talking to us a little bit about how you ended up coding that? Sure, I didn't have much time, so I just did keywords. Um, the learning outcome is pretty straightforward in terms of needing to evaluate experiential results. So I just went through and looked at how many times the students identified evaluation in their comments. Um, only one of the students, I believe, directly referenced evaluating experiential results. Um, the rest just kind of alluded to it. Mm -hmm. um, if I had had more time, I probably could have parsed through and <laughs> um, made more complex analysis in terms of the different keywords that were used. But for this exercise, I just concentrated on keywords. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, and so that was pretty much um, basically what we did. Um, although I will say in, in the way that I did the analysis, I did take a slightly different approach um, in terms of less, less looking for like the keywords of what students did and sort of looking at uh, like a little bit of the trends. And so, Sarah, if you go back to the slides. And click on the next one. Oh, yeah. So. Actually, we'll skip that question and then I'll come back. Go go back one. There you go. Okay, so in, in the terms of the ways in which um, we did the results, you can kind of see how, uh, and I'll drop the results page in the chat as well so you all can follow along with that if you'd like. Um, the way in which we sort of took the results was like slightly different. So um, the way in which I was looking at that question in particular, I kind of saw what students were alluding to. So. In that question, we're asking them to identify like a specific instance. Um, in many cases, you would have students that would say, they would name a specific uh, lab where they felt like they were a scientist and were able to sort of interact or uh, interact with like experimentation. And then you would see some students sort of say, oh, all of the labs or you know, pretty much all of the labs. Uh, then you would have some students who mentioned like some of the labs or like most of the labs. And then you would have another group of students that were like just generically referred to the lab section as a part of how they did that. But I, I do also like Catherine's approach of looking at what were the specific words or how are you talking about, were you explicitly um, uh, referencing experimentation or were you uh, sort of implicitly referencing it in the way in which they were talking. Um, some of the notable responses that came out of both Aaron's and Rebecca's surveys um, of, uh, of a physics 160 versus bio 100 was that uh, nearly half the students in both classes were men mentioning some sort of tangible nature to the lab that supported their learning from lecture. And that would attain to, I believe it's the second question um, in which students are asked like, what about the reciprocity of um, lecture versus lab? How was lecture helping lab? How was lab helping lecture? Most of them are talking about um, how lab and being able to apply what they learned in lecture in a more physical way as helping their learning and making it more um, like solidified in their brains. Uh, about half of the bio, bio students and about uh, a quarter of the physics students were mentioning how their specific course contributed to skill building or was used in some way or another in another course. Uh, many of the physics students talk about the Excel skill, so using Excel in the class to sort of generate results and calculate things. And then a lot of the bio students end up talking about um, how they were taking what they learned in the classroom and then applying it to 
there. Um, the they did a, a visit to the visit to the zoo where they were able to um, sort of interact with and watch the behaviors of animals and taking that and applying that was really useful for a lot of them. And then the third big result was uh, students of both both classes seemed to really to take to those assignments where they could go outside of the classroom and go somewhere and uh, sort of see it in real time. So uh, in many classes, like I said, just now for uh, biology, it was the zoo. And then for students in the physics class, they went to the Natural History Museum. I think Sarah, you can go to the next slide. Then I'll turn it over to Aaron and Rebecca. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, going through these results and, and how, you know, what I learned and how I might use them in my class for Physics 160. And then Rebecca will talk about for Bio 100. Uh, so there's just a couple of little bullet points here, just sort of general uh, things that, that we can do with the results. Um, and I'll just, I'll end up talking about those a lot over the next couple of slides. So, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that I did when implementing the survey, we had some discussions about whether or not to do this anonymously or how do we get students to actually take it seriously. Um, what I did for 160 is I gave this during the last week of classes via Canvas. Uh, so it was just a, a quiz set up on Canvas. And what I told the students was if they completed it, I would add five points to their final exam score. So not, not overall grade, but just the final exam itself. And I think across the three classes I've given, or the, the three semesters I've done this now, I've got a, about a 95% completion rate. Um, most, you know, almost all students do it. Uh, I don't make the survey anonymous, uh, but I do tell the students that I'll wait until after the end of the semester to look at my answers. And it's kind of a show of good faith. I point out that you know, I've had a couple of students that just submit blank surveys. They just go into Canvas and submit the quiz without entering anything. And those students have gotten the five points added to their final exam grade um, because, I, like I said, I don't look at this until after the semester is over. Uh, but one thing that I find, I know there, there's good reasons for anonymous surveys, but I also like having a name attached to the comments because sometimes it gives interesting context. Uh, a, a quick sort of related story is one semester I had a student that was always in the front row, came to every class, took notes, paid attention, did terribly in the class, and I was confused as to why this was the case. And in the semester survey, the student told me that they wished that they had learned more about um, their horoscope and their future and things like that. So clearly they thought they were in astrology, not astronomy. And so it's like, okay, well now it makes sense why you struggled in this class because you thought you were in a completely different class. Um, there's one possibility with giving this during the last week of classes that it might cause students to be less likely to complete their SETs. I'm not completely sure if that's, if there's a conflict there, if the students just don't want to do the SUTs, uh, but having kind of everything overlap at the very last week of the, the semester gives, makes that a possibility that students are just like, I'm not doing more things. And if SEC, SET doesn't give me points to my final, then I'm not going to do that one. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? So for the evaluated experimental results, um, when I went through that, Basically, everybody points to a lab. There's only a couple of mentions across the three semesters of anything in lecture, which is kind of to be expected because you know, this is a lab class experiment. Makes sense that students would put those together. Uh, most of the labs that the students have done mentioned at least once, but in a lot of cases, they were only mentioned once. Um, two of the labs, there's a, a lab about uh, observing seasonal changes and moon phases, which I'll talk about on the next two slides that got a ton of mentions. And part of why I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail is because they get mentioned for all four of the questions, um, even if it's not really related to lab, like those two uh, experiments keep coming up. And something that's interesting, that probably a little more interesting to the, the rest of the committee members for the Natural Scientific Inquiry Committee, I did have a, stu a few students tell me that they didn't do any experiments in this class. Um, and the reason this is, might be interesting is because We've had discussions about adjusting the learning outcomes because experiment might be narrowly defined by some people as you have to be in a lab with mixing chemicals together. Um, so I thought it was interesting a few students 
claimed that they didn't do any experiments. Um, in reading through this, one of my takeaways from this is the possibility of trying to come up with more observing labs. Um, and what I mean by that will become a little more clear when I talk about the next couple of slides. Uh, I put the question mark there because the weather and the light pollution in DC and on campus is pretty bad. So it makes observing labs pretty difficult to do um, just because the randomness of whether or not you'll actually be able to see what you're trying to see uh, makes that difficult. Um, one of the things that's in here that I think I might mention on another, another slide is that a few of the students um, have pointed out or you know, back up step action and say, after the first time that I did this in, in uh, spring of 23, I was thinking about dropping one of these observing labs because students complained about them being you know, difficult to complete. Uh, but then when looking through the, these comments from students, a number of students noted that these labs actually made them get themselves better organized. Uh, because to keep up with this and, and take the data, uh, they, they had to actually start paying attention to things like when their schedule lines up with the weather and when they need to go outside for their observations. Uh, so they're, they're sort of a not quite what I was expecting was a benefit of these labs. Uh, if we could go, Sarah, to the next slide. So briefly, the Observing Seasonal Changes Lab is one that students, every two weeks or so over the course of a semester, they have to pay attention to two things. Um, they have to look at the where the sun sets on the horizon or sunrise if you know, students get up early. Um, and the picture on the left is one of my students, um, her balcony and her apartment looks west. And you can see she made a sketch of like what the building and the trees and everything looked like and then marked the, the six observations she made of where the sun was relative to what she could see in the sky um, at or close to sunset. So it was sort of getting students to notice the position of the sun is changing. And then the picture on the right uh, is from a different student. One of the things that they had to do also was at solar noon. So when the sun is at its highest point in the sky for that day, and to go outside and measure the length of the shadow of an object. And you can use that to calculate how high in the sky the sun is at that time. And it's just another way to visualize the change in where the sun is. So the fact that it gets lower in the sky as you go towards winter, and then it gets higher in the sky as you go towards summer. Uh, so like I said, it's something that they're supposed to take observations about every two weeks if the weather cooperates and their schedule cooperates. Uh, and this was one of the labs that students kind of noted whether or not they got anything scientifically out of it. I had a lot of students tell me that they had to start paying attention to weather and scheduling in a way that wasn't, uh, they hadn't necessarily done before. And if we look at the next slide, similarly, there's a, a lab about observing the phases of the moon where students every, over the course of a month, they're supposed to go out every couple of days, ideally. Uh, and find the moon in the sky and take some measurements about where it is relative to the horizon, what time they observe, what phase it's in. Um, and these two pictures are from the same student's uh, notebook that was turned in with what the phase of the moon was that he was looking at. And then on the right-hand side with the, the combination of where you're looking in the sky to see the moon and what time of day it is, you can mark where relative to the earth the moon is physically in space. And so this allows students to both see that the moon orbits around the Earth, that it stays about the same distance away from the Earth at all times, and how the phase is correlated with where the, the moon is relative to the Earth and sun. Uh, the student didn't draw it, but for completeness, the sun would be off to the right-hand side of that picture on the right. So that's why it's illuminating. Like the, the right-hand side of the Earth is white to show that it's illuminated by sunlight. So these two labs are ones where students are having to do some planning on their own. They're making these observations largely on their own uh, and they're, they're sort of long-term labs. And like I said, the reason I'm talking in a little more detail about these two is because these, these come up a lot in comments from students. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, with lecture and lab supporting each other, one of the things that I noticed is that students tend to see and appreciate the connection between the lecture and the lab topics. Uh, it didn't seem to matter if the lecture or the lab topic came first, that there were cases where students were like, oh, we did this in lab and it made more sense in lecture, or we did this in lecture and then it made more sense in lab. 
And I also had the other way where students complained, they're like, we did this in lab and hadn't seen it in lecture, I was confused. Uh, so there's not really a pattern of the way that students like this um, the best. One problem that students did note that is something that I need to fix is periodically if the lab proceeded when the lecture information happened and the lab instructor wasn't aware of that, then the lab instructor didn't necessarily know that they need to get more context. So I need to be a little more careful about making sure the lab instructors know where the lecture is related to that. Uh, as I know, the seasons and the moon phases mentioned quite a lot. Uh, and there's another lab where called Transiting Exoplanets where students look at data related to planets moving in front of distant stars. And that was one where they consistently said that they really liked that they did it in lab before we talked about it in lecture. I don't really know why that's the case, but it's interesting to note that students liked it that way for that particular lab. Uh, things that I can do is think more carefully about aligning the lecture and lab. So are there ways that it would work better to have one before the other? Um, and make sure that sort of everybody knows that there is a particular alignment or even just if one's coming before the other, just make sure that it's clear, hey, this lab typically shows up before we talk about it in lecture or vice versa. Uh, so students know what to expect, and also the lab instructors know what to expect. They know what to expect in terms of student knowledge at that point. Uh, next slide, please. So applying skills outside of class, um, a lot of the things that students talked about were specifically related to astronomy. So they noted that they paid more attention to where the sun and the moon were in the sky or related to seasons or listening to astronomy podcast or reading astronomy articles. Uh, a decent number of students also talked about general skills, like I've noted on there. Um, one of the things I stress with my students is to read very carefully. Uh, and I do this by, I will give them a question and then sometime later I will give them the same question, but with a word reversed or instead of saying you know, from largest to smallest, I'll say smallest to largest. Not, and I tell them it's not to trick them, it's to get them in the habit of making sure that you're actually answering the question that you're being asked, not the version of it that you've seen previously. Uh, labs have a lot of Excel. Students seem to appreciate that and talk about how they use that in other classes as well. Um, something that's interesting is, is I had a handful of students mention that they took the data analysis skills, not so much for like numbers, data analysis, but just looking for patterns, looking for relationships, and they applied those to other classes that were not science or math classes. Um, somebody mentioned using it in a research paper for, I think, a history class that they were doing, that in some of the background reading, they were looking for connections between events um, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily have done previously. Uh, and last fall, I talked to, started talking a little bit more explicitly about metacognition, um, and so getting students to think a little more critically about how they were thinking or how they were approaching the problem, and sort of the big theme that I used was talking about understanding, not memorizing what's going on. So again, looking for patterns, connections as a way of making it easier to remember stuff rather than trying to memorize every single thing that we talked about. Uh, a couple of, so the last two bullet points, or two of the last bullet points there were some really interesting ones. One I'd love to follow up with the student on, but I don't really want to ask too many personal questions. I would love to know how our unit on light help them make more informed decisions during a hospital stay. That's what a student said. There was no more detail about how the light connected to that. I would love to know um, what the, the relationship was there. Um, and I also always appreciate it. I will periodically have students tell me about how they used my class to help them win arguments. Um, and one student was very proud of, of themselves for apparently destroying their sister's boyfriend. Um, so, I, I, you know, that's, interesting random ways that they're <laughs> applying these skills to other things. Uh, so one of the things that, that I'm taking away from this while I'm, I'm doing some course updates this summer is to improve the metacognition components. So hopefully the idea there would be to sort of, in the future, if I, I give the same question, that the shift will be away from, oh, I look at the moon now, whereas you know, students say that they didn't before, and, and that's very directly astronomy related. I'd like to see a shift more to, I took this skill that we learned in the class and applied it to other things. Uh, so 
that would be through doing metacognition, kind of making it more explicit with the students. Why are we learning this or why are we approaching this problem this way? Or what's the, the overall skill that we can take away from, from this thing that's not directly related to astronomy? Uh, next slide, please. And then the, the last question, which was about connecting to the outside world. Again, a lot of mentions about the things related to the seasons in the moon lab. So students paying more attention to the world around them, um, which just sort of generally is good that students are actually, I guess, hopefully looking up from their phones when they walk around instead of just staring at text messages. Um, a number of students really enjoyed the trip to the Natural History Museum to look at their meteorite collection. And there also is a uh, light pollution exhibit, which I think is only there for a couple of years. I don't remember the exact um, end date. Uh, but students have enjoyed looking at those two events. Um, as you're probably aware, we had a solar eclipse, um, actually solar eclipse in the fall and in the spring. And so a number of students mentioned that they were excited to see that happen while they were taking or around the time they were taking astronomy. Uh, a few notes to understanding the process of science better and applying that to other things. Um, one student said that they understood the connection between astronomy and pulp pop culture and why astrology isn't real. Um, and then I had another student tell me it made them more interested in astrology. So I'm, I've tendered my resignation from teaching astronomy <laughs> ever again, because uh, clearly I, I, I did not do something correctly there. Uh, but that's the only person that, that said they were more interested in astrology now. Um, and a few things related to students interested with light and understanding that there's so much more related to light than what we can see with our eyes. Um, so a few connections, you know, beyond sort of the obvious stuff and something that I could do related to that would be additional connections assignments. Um, so things getting students to kind of see the connection between say historical events and astronomy. Um, like one that, that sort of comes up is with, for example, with D-Day, they wanted the tides to be right, which tides are controlled by the moon's orbit around Earth. And they also wanted a full moon, so she actually had some light overnight for the troopers that were parachuting in. And so there's all sorts of these sorts of these kinds of connections between astronomical events and historical things that students could look into uh, that would give them maybe slightly different connections between just saying, oh, I went outside and I noticed that the sun was lower in the sky than today. Uh, so those are all the things that I took away from what my students told me by going through three semesters of these surveys and you know, a little bit of things that I can do going forward to try to improve my class. Um, and I think we go on to Rebecca from here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so um, I love that Aaron did such a great job of kind of like walking through some of the, like showing us how you coded the your own questions. And Aaron's done this survey now a couple more semesters, semesters than I have. I only did it for one semester. And so I'm not going to go through as many like point by point things, um, but Diamond, you can just kind of populate this whole slide if, if you want to. Um, so I was um, hoping to just kind of go over briefly some of the successful approaches that I use to help students recognize the learning outcomes, and um, think about them more critically in a metacognitive way, um, and then go on to thinking about um, kind of like, I've, I also wear another hat as I've, I've been one of the um, members of the first cohort for the AU Advance team for term faculty. And so, and I also went through the process of um, continuing appointment and promotion this year. So I've been thinking a lot about our um, building out the, teaching portfolio and kind of how we can document these processes that we're doing to improve our courses in ways that like demonstrate our professional growth in um, yeah, like a, a way that can go into those files. All right, so um, next slide, thank you. Okay, you can populate this slide to Diamond since I'm not driving. <laughs> thank you. Um, so when I first inherited the Essentials of Biology course, and I, I wonder how, I, like, I think this probably happens to a lot of people that enter AU, pick up a Habits of Mind class, um, and um, maybe inherit one from another person who already taught it. 
I wasn't really, I was just kind of told like, here's a boilerplate. You have to put these learning outcomes on your syllabus, but I didn't have someone kind of talk to me about them, walk me through it. Um, and I, I have to confess that at the beginning, I was just, you know, kind of getting adjusted to my new job and didn't pay as much attention to them as I, I should have. Uh, but as the years went on and I um, really embraced this course as my own and got past that first awkward semester, um, I started integrating the learning outcomes in more ways. So up in the upper right, um, you can see this is just kind of where I have them on my syllabus, but I didn't really talk about them in, in the class. But then on the left, this Bio 100 Science, tor st science Storytellers Planning Worksheet. So this is one of the assignments in the class that I think um, led to me having like a, a, like a um, pretty good response related to how students might use some of the, the processes they're learning in Bio 100 for their um, critical thinking in other classes because this stepwise um, process has them like um, doing a lot of scientific literacy work and in finding their own research articles and then in this planning worksheet they basically work through the rubric that I will eventually use to grade them on but in kind of like a proactive like how are you going to demonstrate these learning outcomes way so I start off with the natural scientific inquiry learning outcomes and then give them kind of like a more um, fleshed out rubric for the assignment. Uh, and some other assignments I that maybe uh, one of the things we've talked about in um, in in the core in general and a lot of the courses in the core is that every assignment is not going to check every box right and so there are some there are times when I will include the learning outcomes but then point the students to certain learning outcomes. Um, but one of the things I noted like so this kind of gets the learning outcomes on students radars and uh, kind of reminds them that they are supposed to, this is, this is the big picture, this is what we promised you is happening in these classes, but it might not necessarily um, have them engage with the learning outcomes in the way we want them to. So uh, Diamond, you can go to the next slide. So I started thinking about um, kind of the, the metacognition things that we do. I had the, we have these pre-lab discussion notebooks where students do um, kind of work in and reflecting on news articles that we read related to popular science. And um, then I also had integrated this one that asked them to do a reflection and thinking about why it's important for non-scientists to take science classes, right? And um, some of the responses from this were, were really powerful and um, made me think more about metacognition and how we could kind of like join forces between a, a reflection step like this and uh, the, our learning outcomes. And so um, right before I deployed my survey, uh, Diamond, you can go to the next slide. Um, I had asked, I had, um, in, in that, that zoo, um, the, the zoo project that Diamond mentioned a couple of times that kind of ended up being a very popular um, assignment that the students pointed to a lot in their surveys. Um, I had added, I added in this step, part three is asking students to specifically think about the habits of blind mind learning outcomes, uh, presented the learning outcomes, but then gave them a table where they could kind of explore how they did each thing. And I wasn't sure what I would get back. I was kind of afraid that students would be like, yeah, didn't get that. But um, then I mean, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a good representation of the types of responses that I got when I added this in. And um, students were, were giving great examples and like tangible um, ex examples of how they had accomplished the learning outcomes and they really got it. It was, it, it was um, a, a pretty, pretty awesome insight for me and made me think one of the improvements I'd like to make in the course is to, I, I was thinking like, maybe I should put this in more assignments, have a, a last step where they do this kind of reflection specific to the learning outcomes um, and have that them think more metacognitively about this process. Um, all right, I uh, can go to the next one. Um, so using the survey tool for the future and kind of like um, thinking, so things like, uh, what, what are the things that it helped me to do and thinking about the learning outcomes is um, 
I, I, I realized that there were some places where I needed to do some more backward design and restructuring of some of the assignments or when I was creating new assignments, remembering that uh, I shouldn't just be creating assignments around the content that I want to present, but it should all start with these learning outcomes, right? And um, it's, it's something I know, uh, and I, it's, it's so easy to forget when we get kind of caught up in the minutia of the, the details of science or whatever habit of mind we're teaching, it can be easy to uh, design, a pro a design an assignment around content instead of on the uh, learning outcomes. So um, it's, it just, it, the survey acted as a great reminder uh, that students are, can pay attention to this and that if we start off, start them off thinking about the learning outcomes and the assignments at the outset, that it can strengthen their connection to the big picture. All right, Diamond, we can go to the next slide. And so um, with that in mind, um, one of the ways that we could harness these surveys uh, and, uh, the, and any feedback that we get from students about our habits of mind, but especially in relation to um, the core learning outcomes, we can, um, as Aaron really beautifully demonstrated in his slides, that he uh, kind of took these emergent themes and then boiled them down to like, what are the imminently doable things that I can do to improve this course next time? And I think that's one of the most powerful things about these surveys is um, how we can hear what works well, how can we do more of that? And then how can we adapt and adjust when students have criticism? Um, we can go to the next slide, Diamond and we can populate that. Um, so uh, this is kind of, uh, this is uh, demonstrating a, so I actually made a handout for everybody, but nobody's, it's just, a, <laughs> yeah, or, um, this is um, a process that I've used for kind of like uh, distilling down student feedback in ways that can, then that I can use for course improvement in the future. Um, in these surveys, the way that they were structured related to our learning outcomes, uh, the students were pretty positive. I get them, I think sometimes we get SET feedback. There can be some themes like this first box up here. The first step that I do when I'm kind of like doing this systematic approach to processing my own student feedback is like if there's something that's not growth minded or can't do anything about or like will not add to immediate improvement in the course and maybe undermines my confidence as an educator, I put it in that first box and then or have a reminder to myself, like tear that up and throw that away because it's not going to help you grow and change, right? Um, uh, sometimes we can, as we probably all know, we can get uh, feedback that is, is personal or um, biased, right? Moving on. From there, the next uh, process that I go to is thinking about the emergent themes that I view as positive feedback. This is something that worked well and think about the action items where I could um, take that positive feedback and do more of it in the course and think about, again, like Aaron did, like imminently doable changes that I could incorporate. And then the last part is to move on to recognize the the, um, the feedback, sorry, I have these in opposite order, the feedback that is um, constructive but critical and um, thinking about how you can make adjustments to the course that respond to that. Um, and sometimes there are things that feel hard to read that actually do have some kernels of truth in them, right? If uh, students are being critical. So um, this helps me kind of like, again, zoom out and think about emergent themes of this feedback. All right, uh, Simon, thank you. Um, and so this is great for improving courses, right? And making, it, like, ultimately, we've got a better product for our students or we we're helping them grow and change um, uh, as uh, citizens of the world. But we can also use this for our own um, success as educators, our own growth, and we can demonstrate our professional development if we do things like documenting, it was like the, again, the handout. Um, but if we do things like what, I was just thinking when Aaron was presenting, like you could just take those slides and pop them into your teaching portfolio and show that you've done this work as a self-assessment, right? Um, uh, so in our um, new model of our um, of the promotion and, um, and 
and reappointment, we have this kind of more holistic view of, of educators, right? And what it means to succeed. And so uh, traditionally the SEG feedback had the numeric scores were so important, but now there are categories like the non-numeric student assessment, right? So the, the surveys that we've just been talking about, you could use that there, right? That could be, that could populate that, that category. Um, and then Diamond, if you flip to the next slide, but you can also um, include the analysis of that work, right? This kind of like breakdown of the emergent themes and thinking about the, um, the, the, the imminently doable changes you could make to improve the course. You could include that in your narrative. You could include it as a self-assessment. And I did do a similar uh, kind of like a, a analysis and included it for my own successful um, reappointment and uh, re reappointment and um, promotion portfolio last year. And um, yeah, so this has been successful for me. And I think that it, it shows that we are uh, not afraid to hear our students and um, do hard things. Okay. Um, yeah, that's everything for um, my slides. Thanks. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, I just saw that I received an email about my SET feedback <laughs> coming out. And so, yeah, um, if every, if anyone is interested in getting a copy of the, the worksheet that I just mentioned to process their SETs, just email me. So I think um, at this point, we've got the discussion questions up on the screen. So this would be a point where we could talk about or I guess give you the opportunity to talk about things related to your classes. Um, we don't have to like go through all four of these. These are just some example questions that, that we thought about. Um, or just generally, if you have questions for Martin, Rebecca, or I about surveys, natural scientific habit of mind, core stuff, uh, we're happy to, to discuss. Take your questions at this point if you have any. Um, you can raise your hand, turn on your microphone, start chatting, put it in the chat window, whatever you feel comfortable with. Happen to have any questions? I guess I'm, I also have a question for our audience. Um, uh, folks that are here, are, what, I'm curious, like what, courses you teach, or if you teach them in the habits of mind. Maybe well, uh, if, if the audience wants to like drop some of that information in the chat. I, I saw I read my SCTs yesterday. Okay. Um, I, I sometimes wait a few weeks, but I was brave yesterday, so I checked them out. Um, and I had a really interesting response, and this is going to maybe get a little meta, but I would maybe this is kind of an interesting place to throw it out. The student in their critique said um, it was the class was discussion, lecture, and essays, and no real assessment of learning. And I was I thought to myself, but is not lecture, discussion, and essays in fact assessment of learning, right? Like we like do the learning and we do the discussing. And then you do the writing and I do the responding and that, right? And so, so but there, it suggests to me that there was some kind of like, now this is a 300 level seminar course, right? And it's a little different maybe from a class that's got like exams or whatnot. But I was struck that the student didn't see that experience as an assessment of learning, right? And so there's, I, I, I and this is where now we get to my question, which is kind of meta, right? Like um, how explicit, it, Clearly I wasn't explicit enough for this particular student. And I've never seen a response like this before, but, but I was like, huh, why did that student not see that process as, as entailing an assessment of learning, right? And what were they looking for and how, like maybe there was something in how I set up the essays themselves that I needed to like be more explicit about, right? This is where you will illustrate learning outcome X or something, right? But I don't know I, if anybody's got thoughts about that, right? I, I would be, I would be curious. I, I was struck by it. It almost sounds like they were expecting there to be a test, 
and that you would grade the test and they would get an A and that would tell them that they learned something. <laughs> right. That's what it feels like. Yeah, that's what it felt like to me too. I was like, but that's like day one, right? You got the syllabus, you saw the assignments. Like there was no, I, I don't know. I was, I was sort of shocked. Um, is this mostly majors in the class? It was a little bit of an odd class. Uh, and so it had a really diverse uh, cross section of students, um, many from the same department, but uh, there are four or five different majors that were represented. Uh, hmm. uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe they were just peculiar in a sense, but um, yeah. I guess what I'm, what I'm driving at there, right, is that uh, the, the surveys that you all did. Um, ask students to sort of like point to like, hey, where is this learning outcome happening? And I wonder if I were to try to, if I were to do that for, for that student, right? Um, like they didn't see it happening, right? And, and so uh, perhaps that's about, as I said, maybe we need to be more explicit in the assignment prompts saying this is where these things are happening, right? But uh, I wonder if they're Ask that directly. Oh, like where do you think this occurred in the class? Maybe they could, in fact, identify it, right? Even if it were not showing up in like some kind of particular artifact. Totally, it's like giving them a roadmap. Like yeah. they're like, I've never been to that place before, and they're like, Wait, look. Yeah, <laughs> you've you, you been here a few times already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, in fact, is a repeat visit. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was really. Um, some of these things are so simple, like. Hey, we're going to do these things, right? That's what learning outcomes are. You're going to demonstrate this by the end of the semester, um, and it's 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 like I'm saying to Marjan. Sometimes you're like so close to it, like this, and you forget that you need to zoom back a little bit and think about it, like further to the back of the room. Um, that's kind of what we need to do for our students. And when I put that structure on there, just asking them, like, "Hey, we're going to do these things," and the responses just really blew my mind. I thought like this is really powerful stuff and it should be in more of one assignment. I you know with, with the caveat that like we want to make sure that we're not getting overly repetitive about it in a way that makes them just feel like it's busy work. But in that instance, I felt like it was really powerful. I'm curious if I, part of the reason I asked if there are other people to hear from other disciplines and have it in mind. I, I'm just curious, like what this might look like for other, like other habits in mind beyond natural scientific inquiry, if they are interested in this, like or what, how learning, we, we talk so much about our own learning outcomes or this kind of like special thing with the lab and the lecture. And um, yeah, I just wonder if they focus as much on the yeah, I mean, I could imagine as some of our other subcommittees getting interested in this, and I'm thinking in particular, and it might seem a little bit strange, but that uh, creative aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, would be a particular place where this could happen because there's always the, the tension in, in creative aesthetic is that it's got um, all of these courses that are the production of an artistic work, and then the other sort of half of the courses are the critique of works of art, right? And the habit of mind requires that there be both, right? That there be some sense, or not that you don't have to like make art in every class, but that you need to consider both the critique of and the construction of as part of part of what happens there, right? And I think that that, you know, in some sense, the artificiality of conjoining critique and creation in that habit of mind might yield a little bit of confusion for students as to where particular learning outcomes are happening. And so to take a survey like this and ask students if they can identify it, right, could yield some really interesting results. And then I'd want to sort of compare those two subsets of courses, right, the critique oriented and the creation oriented, and see if there's real like disparity between the, the, the students' experience of those learning outcomes, or if in fact it's like really happening organically. Um, it, or, right, and so, so this is my, my first thought about like next semester, I'll be like, hey guys, 
And that side did this cool thing. They're like, the scientists are like, no, no, I think this is going to work for yeah. artists, right? I think, I think there's something to that. So, yeah. Um, I just want to tell you that I also did a survey in my class, and it's interesting that doing this survey helps um, um, both instructor and the student know where they are and what they want to do or what they gain. So specifically for my cooking, chemistry of cooking class, I saw that they liked the project. They did they, they, something, they, they related these things to the, um, uh, to, uh, science and um, they enjoyed it. Even they said that we are better cook now because because we know what to do, what to, what what's going on, and then what should we control? Like should we control the temperature, time, and all those things that is related to physical chemistry we applied, and then they were able to. So I think that doing this survey is really interesting. I even mentioning the learning outcome during the semester that's going to help them much more. And I have demo in my class, so I know that they really that. They I really see. love that. <laughs> and I, and I cook and then I talk about the cooking process, plus scientific uh, issues, and then my, I mean, subjects, and then they really enjoy it and they sometimes they come and they say, oh, can we try it? <laughs> and sometimes, can we have some samples? And then, oh, we're jumping back to our office. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but this is also, they also like that. Uh, they mentioned that they're learning how to talk about That helped them in real life. Are there any uh, questions or observations from, from anybody online? Um, you could just uh, go off mute and bring it up or uh, uh, drop something into the chat. Um, not maybe we just wrap up. We don't have any additional questions. Otherwise, if there aren't uh, any, any additional questions, I, I think maybe we'll we'll call it a day. Um, thank you, uh, Rebecca and Aaron, especially, and and, and Diamond. Um, uh, appreciate everybody being here, and uh, have a lovely summer. Thank you, thank you. Have a good summer, everybody. Thanks, everyone.